there, but because I forgot. <laughs> well, today I'm going to break the cardinal rule of preachers. There's a, there's a rule that says you never follow an evangelist with a preacher. You know what the difference is between a preacher and an evangelist? A preacher preaches about the Lord. And the preacher cannot say anything that's going to hurt the congregation. But an evangelist has three things that he can do. An evangelist shows up, an evangelist blows up, and an evangelist takes off. So as a preacher, it's never a good thing to follow a pre uh, an evangelist. But today, I'm going to follow the Word of God. I was really amazed, brother, to hear you talking about second chances because the title of my sermon is The God of Second Chances. <laughs> so when I was, uh, this morning I went to another, another church, uh, uh, Pastor Doro, uh, Dehef, excuse me, Moses Dehef, and uh, we went to his church and they were preaching on Thomas and the second chance that Thomas had because he doubted God. And one of the great things that I got out of that sermon this morning was this. Thomas, in the flesh, could not believe that Jesus had left him. And I think that's the reason that Thomas doubted. Because he felt he had been let down, that the Lord had left. and He didn't know what was going to happen. But Thomas said, unless, unless I see him, unless I see his nail-pierced hands, unless I put my fist into his side, I won't believe. But when Thomas saw the Lord, when the Lord entered that room, what did he say? Peace to all of the apostles. And then he turned and looked at Thomas and he said, Thomas, come up here, bring your finger and put your finger into my wound and put your hand into my side. Because Jesus was there when Thomas was saying it to the disciples. He was not there in the flesh, but he had been resurrected. And in his resurrection, he was able to be at all places at all times. He knew the doubt that Thomas had. And he knew that the only way that Thomas could understand was to be confronted with his own words. So he didn't say and say, Thomas, trust me because I am Christ. Thomas, trust me because the Bible says this or the prophets say this. He said, Thomas, give me your finger and give me your hand because that's what Thomas said he wanted. But what did Thomas do? Did he go up and touch his hand? Did he go up and touch his side? No. He fell down to his knees and he said, My Lord and my God. This is the God of second chances. Most people don't realize China, China was evangelized by Thomas. And the greatest church in China is the church of Thomas. The oldest church in Christendom is the church of Thomas in China. Doubting Thomas became one of the greatest evangelists because he no longer doubted. Because God gave him a second chance. Thomas went from being a doubting Thomas to being a glorious Thomas, to being a resurrected Thomas, to being a Thomas who had been given not only what he had in the past, but much more. Overflowing. Because there was no more doubt in his mind. He had been given a second chance. Brother, you talked about second chances. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Because when I was studying this week and preparing for my sermon, the Lord has a sense of humor. A lot of times He'll let me get through the entire process, and I'll get my message ready, and I've got all my verses, and I've done all my research, and I get in the car, and God says, uh-uh, here's what I want you to preach on. It always gets me because I'm not prepared. But that's the great thing about it, because God gives me a second chance to let Him preach Amen. instead of letting me preach. So today you get to hear what God wanted you to hear, not what Moses wanted you to hear. Okay? Uh, let's turn, if you would, to Judges, uh, starting in uh, chapter 13. Uh, chapter 13. We're going to talk about Samson. There's a few things that I would like you to just follow through. We don't need to read through the entire process, but it's, we're going to go from chapter 13 through chapter 16, the end of chapter 16, the story of Samson and Delilah. This is not preached on very often in the church, and when it is, it's always about how great Samson's faith was. It's always about how, how, what a strong, powerful man he was, and how many people he killed, and how 
it's always about the strength of Samson. Today I want to talk to you about the weakness of Samson. I want to talk to you about a man who knew who he was in Christ, or in God in, in those days. A man who knew his destiny. A man who from the day that he was born was consecrated to his Lord and would not cut his hair because he was consecrated. There were rules that had to be followed in those days. As a Danite, when his mother gave birth, the angel that came to see her said, Do not drink wine, do not eat of the grapes of the vine, and do not eat any unclean food. So the three things that she was prohibited from doing are the things that the Jewish tradition teaches that one must do as a priest in order to retain his priesthood. So when Samson was born and dedicated to the Lord, okay, he was dedicated to God himself, not only as a Jew, but he was dedicated to the God, to his God as a Nazarite. And the Nazarites were dedicated and retained and protected by the family. The family made sure that nothing came in between him and the destiny that God had called him to. So Samson was raised in that environment. Samson was raised in an environment where he knew from day one, from the day that he could walk, from the day that he could talk, that God was with him because he was chosen of God. Correct? Yeah. Samson was a man of God. But Samson was a man. And when Samson had all of the women in, in Judea or the area that he was at, beautiful women running all over, he was not satisfied because the grass is greener on the other side. Right? So what does he do? He goes into the next town and he finds a harlot. Because there's not enough women in the Jews. So he goes and he finds a harlot. Because they're better looking. Because it's always more. We're always looking for that extra. We're always looking for something that gives us that oomph that we don't get in our own environments. And that's humanity. That's what God created us to do. The reason that man has what we have is because there is a drive in us to find things that are better. To create. To develop. To research. But there has to be controls put on us by God and by ourselves in order to stay righteous and on the path that God has called us to. Samson did for a while exactly what he was called to do. It says that Samson judged Israel for 20 years. So this was not a man that was dilly-dallying and running around. and He was a judge. The entire kingdom depended on his word. He had a responsibility to his people. He had a responsibility to his God. And he had a responsibility to himself. The problem is when the world creeps in on us. The devil tends to give us the baubles that flash and sparkle and look better than what we have. So we're, I, our eyes are drawn to that, ooh, I haven't seen that before. That's what Samson did. Samson saw a beautiful girl and he went for it. And ever since the day that he turned from the calling that he had and walked away from the anointing that he was under, it didn't matter in, in God's eyes whether his hair was cut or not. Because when he was with the harlot, God was not in his realm of thought. He wasn't thinking about God. He was thinking in the flesh. The weakness of man can only be controlled when we succumb to the power of the Holy Spirit that goes over our weakness and our weakness can no longer be seen. Amen. The weakness of man cannot be overcome by our own might. Amen. We ourselves have no authority, no power, no strength to overcome our weaknesses unless we subjugate them to the power of the Holy Spirit that resides within us. Hallelujah. So when the power of God comes on us and when we face temptation, and we face those things that draw us away from our Lord and Savior, that draw us away from the faith that we know is right, that draw us away from the things that we were taught when we were babies. Thank you very much for that. It's those things that keep us on track. It's those things that overcome the weakness of the flesh, because the Spirit of God overcomes the weakness of the flesh. But we have to understand that we have no right, we have no authority in our own right to declare anything. Only when it is declared through the power of the Holy Spirit, only when it is de declared under the name and the authority and the glory of the God of heaven, only then can we overcome. Because without God's help, we have no power. Without God's help, we are as weak as Samson was when his locks were cut off. 
So if we look at Samson's story, Samson went into the Danites and met with, uh, I mean, that's where he was from, the tribe of, uh, of Danites. His father's name was Manoah, and he was from the town of, of uh, Zorah. There was no drink allowed in his family because of him. If you read through, his father asked the angel, what shall we do? So he's asking the angel, teach us what we have to do to protect the anointing over him. So this was not a family that already knew the anointing of God. This was not a family that already knew what was expected of them. It's not a family that knew how to handle an anointed child of God. But they had the mental aptitude to go and say, please, teach us what we must do to protect the anointing over this child. How many of us have children that we know are anointed of God? And how many of us sit before God on a daily basis and cry out to God, Lord, teach me how to protect the anointing of my child? I'm guilty. I let life get in the way just like Samson let life get in the way. Because life has a habit of doing that. Life has a habit of coming over you like a tsunami. Day by day, something happens. And you're rushing from here to there trying to figure out how to handle it. Which means we're constantly in a state of storm instead of being in a state of peace. I remember the story, I don't know if you guys saw it, in India when they had the tsunami. And there was devastation. The entire village had been destroyed, completely wiped out. The only building standing in the entire village was a little grass hut church. The waters, they said, went, came rushing towards the church. And as they approached the church, the water split completely around the church and went around it. The entire village was destroyed. One grass hut church stayed, did not even get hit with the water. It went around it. Why? Because the glory of God was in a little grass hut church. Because there was a pastor and four people on their knees and saying, Lord, if you're going to take us, take us now. But let your glory be done in this situation. Let the people in India see the God of heaven. Let them see your might. Let them see your power. Let them see your over... What's the word I'm looking for? That you are over even the waters. Yes. And what they saw was that this little church with five people praying were able to stop an entire tsunami that came against them. Not because of their power, but because they prayed to the God of heaven and they realized that entire region became evangelized by four people and a pastor that believed. That village was rebuilt, and there are people now that are flooding that area because they know that the God of the pastor and the four people in that church is a God that can do miracles. Amen. Samson knew that there's a God that can do miracles because from his infancy, it says the power of God would come over him where the Spirit of God would come over him and he would do mighty things. He was a warrior. He was a man that was not afraid to go against 10,000. All he needed was the bone of a jackass and the power of God, and they better run. Because this man destroyed 1,000 foreign soldiers with the jawbone of a donkey. Yep. He had no armor. He had no weapons. But he had the weapon of God, which at that point was whatever was handy. Because <laughs> it didn't matter what was in his hand, because what was in his heart yep. is what drove the situation. That's what Samson was, and he knew it. There was no doubt in his mind that the God of heaven was with him. There was no doubt in his mind that God created miracles through him, and that God would always be there for him, and that he was there to protect the people of Israel. No doubt in his mind. But all it took was one little skirt to change his attitude. One look at a pretty woman, and his mind went from being on God to, oh my God. And that's what happens with us in the, in the real world. New car comes out, got to have the car. Got to work harder to get that car. Now I got to go out and get a second job because I need a house to put the car into because the garage isn't big enough for the car I want to buy. And it goes on and on and on. We are constantly looking for more. We should be looking for less. We should be looking for less stress. We should be looking for less things that to, to do to give us more time with our children, to give us more time with our family, to give us more time on our knees. But that's not the way the world works. And you hear it all the time. Look at our churches. Our churches have gone from preaching the glory of God to preaching the providence of God. You walk into a church, you don't hear about the glory of God. 
as much as you hear about, give me $50 and God's going to bless you. I hate to say it, but that's the truth. Yep. Our churches have become mercantile. Instead of preaching and teaching that God is the provider. And we don't have to do anything but to believe that God will provide what He has said in His Word that He'll provide. Amen. We start putting quotas on what we need to do. It's not what God teaches. It's not what God shows us. It's not what Samson knew. That's not what you and I know. What you and I know is we get on our knees. We tell God what we have need of because he already knows what it is before we get on our knees. And God takes care of it. That's the faith that I grew under. My father is a pastor. My father raised me in a certain way. And the world tried to take me away from, from the faith. And my mother and father prayed constantly for me. To the point where our church finally had had enough and said, stop, he's never coming back. I'm here to tell you that the glory of God resides in my house because my parents never gave up on me. Amen. I'm here to tell you that the glory of God resides in your house if you're willing to fight for your children. If you're willing to fight for what God has called you to do. If you're willing to fight for the world that you don't know. If you're willing to fight for that person on the street that is spitting on you when you walk by and say Jesus loves you and he spits on you. You curse the spit, but you love the man that spit. That's what we're called to do. That's what Samson was called to do. He was called to be a judge. He was called to be a protector. He was called to be a soldier. In the end, he was just a man. Because when he went in, he thought he was better than they were. And he got to Delilah. I mean, you know, let's take a look at Samson's history. Falls in love with a, with a prostitute. Gets himself in trouble. Then he, that goes away. Then he goes into Timna and sees another woman and says, Hey mom, this one looks good. Go get her for me. Mother and father say no. He, he forces them to do it. I mean, he's continually pressing them to do it. He winds up getting married. At his marriage feast, he gives them a riddle. But why did he give them a riddle? There's always something that God does in preparation for what we do. On his way to the marriage feast... On his way to meet the girl that he's going to marry, a young lion attacks him, right? Yep. He destroys the lion by tearing him in half, like a, lion, like, said, like a goat. The young lion was torn like a goat. Okay? And he leaves the carcass right there where, where he killed the lion. After many months of wooing this girl, he goes back to get her to marry her. And he looks in the lion, back passes the carcass, and in the carcass is a beehive with honey. So he partakes of the honey. Not only does he eat the honey, he takes it to his parents, and they eat the honey from the lion that was killed. Because he did not understand that the lion was sent as a warning. He does not understand that God saw the future of what was going to happen to Samson, and because God saw what was going to happen, he tried to put an impediment in the way to let him wake up and think about, what are you really doing? God sends the lion to get him to think, and he kills the lion, and forgets all about it. He goes back, and after many, many months, he comes back again, only this time he sees honey inside the lion. What does honey represent? The blessings of God. When they came out of Egypt, he said, I will take you to a land of milk and honey. So this was to him was a blessing, yet he does not realize that God is saying, Samson, you killed the lion that I sent to warn you. But I'm still willing to give you a blessing if you will follow me. I'm still willing to give you <coughs> my glory. If you will just come back to me. He takes the honey, he takes the blessing, and he shares it with his family, but he has no idea what he's done. He didn't see it as a blessing. He just saw it as honey in a, in a honeycomb. He goes to the wedding, they get drunk, and he poses a riddle. He thinks he's smarter than they are. And the riddle is, what is strong, I don't remember the exact words, but what is strong and, and sweet. And I'll give you 30 changes of clothing, and if you can tell me the riddle. So now he went from, from not just being a man that disobeyed God by being hooked up with a woman that wasn't part of God's kingdom, now... He's making bets on how smart he is. And God again, over a 30-day period, they had to come up with an answer. Well, 
they knew that if they scared his wife to be, she'd get it out of him because he was already weird. They already knew he was weak with women. So they scared her to get the answer. They come back and give him the answer. Yes, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than wine? And he knew that he'd been had. He knew that his wife had betrayed him. So what does he do? Okay, I'll fix you. You want 30 clothes? He went and killed 30 people from their tribe and gave it to them. Here's their clothes. Again, a man that did not follow God's calling. A man that again took matters into his own hand. He goes back to the father-in-law after a while and says, well, I, want to, I want to go see my wife. I want to go to, to, to my wife's room. And he says, no, because you, you hated her. I gave her to your best man. Well, no man wants to hear my wife was given to my buddy. That's just not what you expect when you show up you know, at your father-in-law's house. So he gets infuriated and says, aha, uh -huh. now I got him. Nobody can judge me for what I'm about to do because they did me wrong. So he gathers 100 or 300 foxes, I think it was, and he ties their tails, puts fire on their tails and sends them into the fields and he burns up all the grain and all the, the vineyards and, and the Philistines go crazy because, you know, who did this? And it was Samson. So what do they do? They go to the house of his wife, not knowing she had been given to somebody else, and they kill, they burn the house down with her and her father in it. Samson gets angry again. This guy just doesn't get it. Here's a man that has the power of God on his life, and he does not get it. Maybe God's trying to get my attention. Hello. He doesn't get it. So he goes out and he pulls some more crazy stunts. Samson had every opportunity. God touched his life. God sent messengers, a young lion, to stop him from sinning. But the sin was greater than his ability to control it. Why? Because at the time that the sin was in his life, or when the sin was coming into his life, he did not have the covering that, he, that the Lord had given him. He was not seeking the covering because every time Samson said, Oh Lord, power of God hit Samson. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he went out and he just wrecked havoc on those people. He killed thousands at a time. So when we, in our weakness, forget to put God above our needs, when we forget to put God above our desires, when we forget to put God above those things that tug at the, spring, the strings of our heart, then how can we expect God to be there when we're not giving Him permission to be there? I had a, a talk with a uh, gentleman that works in Washington, D.C. And they were at a, a meeting in Washington, and one of the congressmen was joking, you know, making jokes uh, about God. I said, well, if God is really God, where is he at? Look what's happening in America. And this young man stood up and he goes, uh, he's exactly where you sent him. Out. You kicked him out of your schools. You kicked him out of Congress. You kicked him out of public buildings. Yes. You kicked him out of public life. You, you prosecute those that try to speak the name of God in public. And then you wonder where God is. He's exactly where you sent him. And until you kneel down and raise your hand to heaven and say, Oh God, forgive me. He's not coming back. Yep. That was the situation with Samson. Until Samson realized that he had stepped so far outside of his calling. God was not going to interfere. God is the most perfect gentleman that ever exists. If you want to define gentleman, you can define it with three letters, G-O-D. Because God is a gentleman. He will never force himself upon you, and he will never demand. He gives you options. He gives us opportunity. He gives us a few nudges in the direction that we can go. But he never forces us to make a decision. That's on us. When we choose to make the wrong decision, that's on us. When we choose to walk into a world of sin, that's on us. When we choose to curse the name of God, not verbally, but by our actions, and people forget, when you step out and curse the name of God by your actions, it's the same as speaking it out. Yep. We don't see that. Samson did not see that. Samson did not see that he was stepping upon the name of God by his actions in being with a harlot and chasing women from a tribe of uncircumcised 
men, as it were, non-believers. Why do we then question what's happening with our children and what's happening with our grandchildren when they don't even know what church is? When they don't even know what it truly means to serve a risen Savior? We have all the tools. We have all the knowledge. We've got the manual. But it's sitting here and keeping it under our arm and doing this doesn't do anything for anybody. It's when this and this combine and all of it drops down to here. That's when you have something. That's when you've got glory. That's when you've got grace. That's when you've got power. And that's when you have a true life worth living. Amen. Samson had it. And he threw it away. Not once. Not twice but three times. And the third time, the third time, he went with another harlot, a woman who got paid for her services, and she convinced him to tell her how his power could be removed from him. Yeah. How many times do we put ourselves in situations where we give somebody else the exact formula on how to destroy our faith? Happens all the time. We don't even realize it. We have no idea what we've done. But we have given them power over us. We have given them authority over us because we have told them what it takes to break us. That's what happened with Samson. Samson was not broken because he was not a strong man. Samson was not broken because God had removed his power and his authority and his grace and his love and his mercy and all of the great things that God had given him at birth. God never removed those from Samson. He removed them from himself. Because when he turned over the authority of his locks, the power, and told Delilah how to destroy the power that God had given him, he took the power away from God and he gave it to the devil. And there's nobody to blame but Samson. God knew what was going to happen because God sent him a message the lion that said you really don't want to go through here I'm going to stop you but Samson overcame the lion not because he had nothing better to do not because the lion was guilty of anything he overcame the lion because he had more desire to go see the, the woman than to understand that God was sending him a message to stop so three times three times he gave away his birthright. Three times he gave away his power. And three times he put himself under the authority of the devil. Yet God himself had mercy. Doesn't mean that he didn't pay for his crimes. Doesn't mean that he didn't pay for his sin. Because his eyes were gouged out. He was forced to work on a grist mill. The man was tortured. Unbelievably tortured. Yet at the end of the day, God had mercy on him. Because his hair began to grow, and those that understood that his power came from his hair, forgot. And they allowed it to grow back. And as his hair began to grow, I personally believe, this is the gospel according to Moses, okay? I believe that as his hair began to grow, his faith in God began to surface again. And he began to remember those things that he was taught as a child. He began to remember the glory that God had on him. He began to remember the power that God had given him. And he began to feel remorse for what he had done. And as his hair grew, he prayed, God, please forgive me. Give me a second chance. Give me a chance to restore myself in your eyes. He didn't care about the rest of the world. Samson at that point could care less about the Philistines or the Martians. It didn't matter. It was about him and the Lord. And the, the problem was that he knew he had walked in sin. He knew he had given away his birthright. And because of what he had done, he did not know if God would answer him. But one day, to make a mockery out of Samson and to prove that his God was not a true God, the Philistines decided they're going to have a great party in the, in the royal palace. And Samson saw his chance. And Samson, being as wise as God had made him, played the part that he was given as the, the fool that they wanted to see and said, let me just feel the columns in the center of the, of the palace. And when he said, Lord, 
Give me a chance. I will die with these uncircumcised Philistines. But give me one more chance. And the Lord filled him with his power again, restored him to the strength that he had, but not only the strength that he had, restored him to the strength to destroy a building with his bare hands. Yeah. And when he pushed and he shoved, I guarantee you it wasn't just Samson. I guarantee you there was about a thousand muscle-bound angels pushing at the same time he was. Because God restored him to his glory. Yes. God restored him to his promise. And God restored him to his place that God had put him in. Samson denied God three times as Peter did. But Samson only needed one more chance. Yes. He only needed a second chance. We many times make mistakes, and we many times walk in sin, knowingly or unknowingly, and then we don't know if God can ever forgive us. The only thing I can say to that is remember Samson. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you know that you have willfully given away your birthright, you have willfully given away the rights and the power and the glory and the grace that God has given you. And you question whether, God, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Will God ever forgive me? The answer is always. Not yes. Not yes. The answer is always. The door is always open. Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Christ came that we might have light in the darkness. And Christ came to make us us, a ray of light and a ray of hope in a dying world. But we have to be willing to take that second chance and step up and say, forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. Amen. That's what we have to do. Amen. So I want to thank you for coming to Sinners Anonymous. <laughs> and bless you. Amen. Thank you.